Hey, Steve Basic Architect. Yeah, got a really good treat for you today. I'm up here on an island off the coast of uh, eastern coast of Canada, and we're about to tour a coastal home with a builder, good friend of mine, Aaron. And uh, Aaron owns Big Dog Construction. So if you're not following him on Instagram or YouTube, give him a follow. But uh, some great stuff we're about to see. So let's head on down and uh, check out this coastal home. All righty, Aaron. What's happening, Let's Steve? check out the uh, inside of the project here. Well, welcome to the main floor. Yeah. So the first thing, when I walked up here, and I, I was fortunate to go downstairs, but I was like, now we have a downstairs, but there's no stairway. But then I noticed there's a hole cut over on the side here under that window that I'm assuming goes down. Yeah, it does. Okay. So Whenever I'm framing, especially if I've got tall walls, yeah. you need as much real estate on the dance floor gotcha. as you can get. So I sheath right over it, temporarily support it. And if I can, especially when I'm using X Factor, I wait till I've got all my windows and doors in. I'm essentially weather tight. Then I'll cut that hole open, install the stairs. Yeah. Then I'll worry about partitions next. Gotcha. And then the logistics are such that we have a loft above us here and so talk to me about a little, how are we gonna solve access to that? Uh, so personally, and I've already, I've already voiced this, uh, my opinion to our client. Um, I don't like the idea of a library ladder here, yep. but the constraints, the dimensions of the house as such are a library ladder. And the library ladder is going to live on a small partition over here, okay. slide out to where we have headroom, and be used right it's it is a long travel for a ladder um but it's technically storage so i don't know how many people are going to be up there or how often they're going to be up there right right so if it's a once a year thing maybe that makes sense because we have i mean this is just under 900 square feet so you're you're probably talking it's like 1750 or something 1760 yeah, we're a little over 900 footage. up here because of the ICF I and the gotcha. thickness of it. We're a little bit a little. less below. Okay, so but, you're at 16, 1700 yeah. feet, somewhere in yeah. that ballpark. Uh, so we have the space. Now, a couple things. We talked about it in the basement, and you can see it here again. Um, we just, I have never used metal truss webs. It's just something that when we order trusses in the U.S., we just never get them this way with the metal connector. So I know. Uh, you know, find that pretty interesting. Um, well, there's pros and cons to it, definitely. Yeah. There are pros and cons to it. It's quite normal in our market. Um, getting a, a different style of floor joist from our manufacturer uh, comes at a significant upcharge with very little benefit, right. if that makes any sense. Right. Now, what's, what I find really interesting, and I don't know how you arrived at this, but maybe you can speak to it. So we have a wall here that's 24 inches on center to the loft. Then it switches to 16 inches on center for the wall, but the floor goes to 19 too. So in this little intersection, we have all three of the common spacings except for 12 inch so, on center. <laughs> and you're gonna laugh at this. This boils down to visual communication. So. I framed this sec or laid this section out 24 inches on center so that it could stack. The trusses would stack directly over top of the studs. Got it. Now, when I got the layout from the truss manufacturer, and I'll show it to you later, it says these floor joists are 16 on 16 inch on center. Okay. Unfortunately, I missed in the details of each individual member, it actually says the spacing is 19.2. So the engineer made an error okay. on the layout, labeled it 16. This section should have been labeled 19.2. And I did not catch it till the wall was actually already sheathed to the point you see it. Yeah. And I was installing the double top plate, which I lay out when it's on the ground. Gotcha. And I was like, wait a minute, 
the math isn't working out here. I don't have that many trusses sitting out there. Oh. And uh, at that point, it was too late to go backwards. Um, you know, we're structurally speaking, we're absolutely fine. Double top plate, 19.2, meets all of the engineering specs for the span. Aesthetically, from a craftsmanship point of view, not so much. Uh, I would be much happier if every single one of these stacked the way this one does. Yeah. No. But again, the house is going to function. Yeah. I mean, three inches off on the spacing, that's not a whole lot to um, <clears throat> be too concerned with. Um, you know, a couple other things that I noticed that you do that are a little different. Um, you know, you tuck your headers all the way up. You don't put them where the head of the actual window or door is, which certainly is, is just fine. That actually offers you the flexibility to, if you had to move that uh, window header or whatever There's, later, yeah. you have that flexibility. But I also noticed you don't, I always put a, what I call a head plate in and then set the header on it. So we have that connection to put drywall in and that actually isn't up there. So you do have the double header, which certainly works, but not having the head plate, I mean, I don't think it really matters, but. So what I often will do there is, depending on how much depth I have, yeah. I'll either put a nailer in there uh, over top of foam, if, okay. I, if I can, or I'll pack that entire cavity out with foam and we'll use drywall adhesive at that point, okay. just to get, you know, a little bit more. But arm. if you're gonna net the wall, why not just net over the whole thing and blow oh, yeah. that? So this wall, in this case, will probably not be netted. Okay. Um, I, I can't say for sure, but I suspect this is going to be bat. Okay. So those lintels will get packed out with foam. Gotcha. Hopefully gotcha. scrap left over, poly iso left over from, from our, our wall That panels. you can just pop off of there. Yeah. Um, salamander windows. We talked about these downstairs. Yep. Um, they're your standard, you know, tilt turn. So 90 degrees turn. Um, that one has a button. Yeah, this one's got the child button that we, we'll talk about, and then the tilt-in. So Sagania Hardware Salamander, they're a European window, um, triple glazed. But the thing I like, and this is the first time I've seen this, it actually has a button here. So I can't rotate that handle unless I push the button. And the reason for that, I'm assuming, is child safety. 100%. So a child can't open the window and take a dive out on their own. Right, they have to be tall enough to open it and smart enough to push the button, which hopefully translates to smart enough not to fall out the window. And, and if you notice, that, bust, that button has quite a bit of resistance. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it takes a little bit of force. So a four year old that. is probably not gonna be able to operate that button. Yeah, and I mean, these are, these are UPVC. This is uh, you know black or anthracite gray, it looks like. Um, they're very well crafted. Like I said, I've seen them. We've never used them, but I mean, your project here would certainly lend me to using salamander windows in the future. Um, this is our first chance that we've had to use them. Yeah. And I have to say, I'm, I'm pleasantly impressed. Yeah, I mean, we use Shuko all the time, which is just another version of these, but it works quite well. Yeah. And I've seen Shuko on your job site, and I was impressed by that. So yeah, uh, it is the same hardware. It's a UPVC. It's just you know Ford or Chevy, yeah. basically. Um, let's talk a little bit about the venting here. Now we just shot a video for you <laughs> where we talked about it. You chose to come on the underside of the roof sheathing. You can see there's. It goes from OSB to plywood there. Yeah. And you basically took a piece of strapping, two and a half inches, and put it vertically on the truss and then nailed into that. So we create a little vented airspace of two and a half inches underneath. So when the plans were submitted for this project, there was some issues with the possibility we might have a hot roof here. Right. And it was easier to push this detail through the planning department than it was to try and do it a different way. Okay. Um, if we weren't already delayed on this project, I may have tried to push a little harder for the hot roof because that was actually my preference for this project. But strapping, it's one by material we can buy off the shelf, 
three quarters of an inch by two and three quarter. We nailed that to the sides of the truss when they were on the ground. We burned up some of our scrap plywood and some of our scrap OSB. Obviously, there wasn't enough. We had to go out and purchase uh, plywood to finish this. But, you know, we eliminate waste where we can. And it's going to function. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's going to do a fine job. And for those of you watching, you know, I broke out the red pen and we... I just quickly illustrated Aaron's way that he did it here, where they basically vented underneath. And the project that we did was we ran two by four strapping on top of the roof and basically vented on top of the roof sheathing as opposed to under the roof sheathing. So it's kind of like six of one, half dozen of the other. They both work. They both work really well. It's a question of, you know, which one did you do which one did I do so I don't think there's a argument mine's better than yours or yours is better than mine they both work they both solve the problem I will say one thing for your detail doing it your way it's easier to maintain that air control layer just wrapping it up over. yeah I would eliminate the floppy bits which right. work very well yeah so this but, is that Sega yeah. my vest detail we use this quite often it comes over the top plate you set your trusses you ran yours between the plates um, and then that'll just simply get nailed up to the truss and then we'll do a Sega yeah. Myrex. We'll see that on the other side. So we can yeah. talk about that there. Um, talk about the view. Yes, that's Atlantic Ocean um, that we're overlooking there. So beautiful view here. Uh, and I'm told occasionally you might see a whale or two frolicking occasionally out there. Occasionally you see a whale or two. Uh, yeah. Minky's in close. Okay. Humpbacks, finbacks, a little further a little out. A little further out. But playing around. A good set of binoculars, you can get some pretty incredible views. And we've got a great view of uh, Gannett Lighthouse there, too. Yeah, I see that out in the air there. And of course, all kinds of uh, other animals, eagles and stuff flying around. So let's take a walk in here and talk about the uh, ceiling detail. Because here we actually have it. You can see we have that MyVest that comes through, and then you have the Sega MyRex, which again, detail. I like that you use the two-sided tape. So um, there's a lot of pros to using that two-sided tape. Yeah, you can stretch it out, roll it up against that, and then it's in place. It, it, it does something else too. So without using the Twinit, which is the double-sided yep. tape from uh, Sega, you're Trusses are kind of hard to find yeah. when you're putting up your strapping. But when you squeegee on that, the Myrex onto that double-sided tape, the adhesive kind of bleeds through a little bit. And gives you a little nailing and line. It, yeah, it highlights your nailing line. We haven't made the connection yet, but you can see... That our, Myrex is just going to fold up, tape off to or the my vest which is the one that you're not holding yeah. will fold up and tape off to the myrex and then we'll get our air barrier continuity coming down the slope over the top plate and then we have the zip system r9 on the outside here so um r9 on a two by six 24 inch on center wall i've also noticed here you uh over, over there, you did some zip, but this is actually liquid flashed. This is liquid flash here. Here, so I really like that. You did a really nice, neat job, and I noticed the back dam is just a vertical board it that just, is uh, put up yeah. against there. So I, you can't see it from here, but I borrowed a detail from you here too. Okay. Because these windows are heavy, and I've got R9, and the windows are set out a little bit, this is actually a rip sill. Okay. So And so this is just that 3 16 padding on the inside. Yeah, just to give us yeah. that back dam. But yeah. the liquid flash gave us an option to keep moving forward on the particular day we were flashing this opening. Okay. Um, as you mentioned before, the Atlantic Ocean is right there. And we just had a solid day of fog. It did not burn off. There was just water literally floating in the air. So liquid flash, we were able to prep these two openings and... Uh, you know, put the window in. Yeah, no, very, very cool. Well done too. I mean, it looks really good. I can see the gap under there. We get some sloping sill. We get some motivation to move that water out. Get some nice light into these spaces I'm a here. huge fan of proper water management details. Flashings are 
probably one of the most important things you can do to save a building. Right, right. Um, sheer wall. Sheer wall. It's um, a tall wall. With some pretty tight nail spacing, it too. It is very tight nail And I mean, we talked about that. I'm we did, but. A couple inches here. Three inches on center. Um, you know, all panel edges and six inches in between. And yeah, it just, I should say it was, anyways. No. We get the idea. It's a tight nailing pattern. It's a, it's, but. yeah. And it's, it's interesting. We have shear going in the direction of this wall. Um, you know, we had a conversation and it's probably more of a conversation with your engineer, but there's no shear in the corners on this wall, which I would question the, the wind integrity of not having it, but I well, mean, since you're... our conversation and, and I've already made, I've asked this question once before, but since our, we had that conversation, I am actually, uh, I'm going to revisit that conversation with our engineer. Yeah, just to find out what his like, thinking was. Why, absolutely. How do we get away with that? And for those of you watching, the, the thing that I'm placing in question is, you know, this is a 10 foot plus wall. And from the corner there to here is probably about 20 inches or so, if I had to guess. And, you know, when you get under two feet, then you have to get into some usually some pretty heavy engineering in there. Even at two feet, my structural engineer say, we have to put in a sheer Simpson strong wall or something in this space. And uh, you didn't have to. And I do notice on some of these uh, walls that desired maybe a little bit of strength, you went with the LVL stud framing and it's a much taller wall. So, I mean, we would probably do the same thing there too. Well, LVL gives us a couple of, um, opportunities. If we didn't use LVL, we would have to double up our two by six. Right. So instead of seeing four ply here, it would be eight ply easily. And that would take us out here. There would be absolutely no cavity insulation left. Wood. It would be solid wood. Yeah. Uh, LVL also gives us a lot more wind resistance. There's less shake in this wall. And when we have a good nor'easter come through, and we've got winds in excess of 100 miles an hour, you know, there's gonna be quite a bit of flex here. Yeah. And this is an amazing window, but if you've ever stood in front of mother nature coming howling at you and saw glass flex, yeah. it's, a, it's an interesting uh, feeling no, watching that. Little diaphragm there. So, yeah. Interesting, so, all right, well. I think that uh, concludes our tour. I mean, there's not 900 feet, not a whole lot, to, <laughs> whole lot to tour, but you know, for the 900 feet, there's a lot of really cool details in here. Um, and if you've noticed, the execution is impeccable. Um, so it's about choosing the right materials, putting them in a position to succeed, but it's really about that execution and getting it done right, which I think you've done a, uh, a great job at. So. Why don't you give us a final word, buddy? Thank you well, for having me. I am really glad you came. And uh, somebody I know once said uh, the best product is the product installed correctly. And I'm Aaron Jones, Big Dog Construction. Apprenticeship is an obligation. Yeah. And I'm Steve Basic Architect. Until next time, long live our buildings.